Chapter 25, Capacitance. First box, why should I care about capacitors? And the first answer is because they're everywhere and they're really important. Capacitance is really important in neurotransmitters, specifically in the neuron cell. This is the Z machine at Sandia National Laboratory. It uses several large capacitors, seen here, to store a lot of electricity and then release it all at once, which creates super strong magnetic fields that are used for fusion research and other research applications. Capacitors are used in power transmission to regulate voltage levels. Capacitors are probably most common in filtering circuits. Sometimes they block high frequencies and let the low frequencies through. Other times they block the low frequencies and let the high frequencies through. This is important for a ton of different electronics applications. Supercapacitors are a new kind of capacitor that's gaining a lot of interest for storing vast amounts of electricity from solar power, wind power, and other forms of renewable energy. Historically, one of the challenges of renewable energy had to do with the inability to store electricity. You had to more or less use the energy as it was being produced. Now with supercapacitors, the hope is we can store electrical energy even when the sun isn't out or the wind isn't blowing. Capacitors come in many shapes and sizes and types, and they're made from a lot of different kinds of materials. These are all relatively small capacitors. Here you see some larger capacitors. And again, here's a bank of capacitors at a power transmission substation. Let's talk again about the electricity plumbing analogy. The amount of water that flows through a pipe is analogous to Q, the amount of charge that flows through a wire. From chapter 24, we said voltage is analogous to a difference in water pressure. Again, a water pump boosts low pressure water to high pressure water so the water comes out of your faucet at a nice rate and a battery takes low voltage or low energy electrons and boosts them to a higher voltage or higher energy so electricity flows nicely through our wires. A capacitor is analogous to something called an hydraulic accumulator. These devices provide clever ways of storing fluid and act as a reservoir. So if you have an overflow of fluid these absorb the overflow and if you need some fluid or have a shortage of fluid these provide what you need. Box number one, definition. Two electrically isolated conductors form a capacitor. Look at the picture in box number two. Those are the two conducting plates that are separated. The two physical characteristics that we care about right now are the plate surface area A and the separation between the plates D. Something does the work to deposit charges on a capacitor. So for example, the top plate might accumulate a charge of plus six coulombs, which means the bottom plate has to have a charge of negative six coulombs. In this case, we would say the capacitor has a charge of 6 coulombs, not 12, not 0, but 6. Box 2, this is why we like capacitors. The charges that accumulate in a capacitor form an electric field between the plates. Notice how uniform the electric field is between the plates. There are some edge effects, but for the most part, it's a very uniform, predictable electric field between the plates, which is a good thing because we can design it for very specific purposes with a lot of accuracy. Check out this capacitor that's being charged by the battery. The battery is doing work to move charges from the top plate to the bottom plate. Look at the graph of charge versus time. It's a logarithmic growth curve and starts off steep and strong because there's no mutual repulsion to get in the way. But as this capacitor gets charged, you can notice that things are slowing down. It's becoming increasingly difficult to take a negative charge from the top plate and move it to the already negatively charged bottom plate because of mutual repulsion. This is where you get the flatlining effect. At some point, the battery won't be able to do the work to move any more charges because there's just too much mutual repulsion getting in the way. Technically, this never really flatlines, but it does approach an asymptote. Okay, let's look at the same thing, a capacitor charging. The battery is doing work to move charges from the top plate to the bottom plate. Now we're looking at a graph of current versus time. Again, at first, it's free and easy and wide open. The current flows at a good rate because there's no mutual repulsion to deal with. But as time progresses and the plate fills up, there is mutual repulsion that gets in the way and we start to decay. The current starts to really slow down and we get this classic exponential decay curve. So the charge buildup is growing logarithmically and the current decay is diminishing exponentially. Okay, now let's look at a capacitor that's fully charged. We take out the battery and the capacitor begins to discharge. All of these mutually repelling charges finally can go home and return the capacitor to a neutral state. Look at the charge versus time graph. At first the charges flow really 
really fast because the churches are very anxious to get away from all of their mutual repelling neighbors. So as time goes by, the capacitor's charge diminishes exponentially. Same thing, we're looking at a discharging capacitor, but now it's a graph of current versus time. In this case, the graph looks just like the discharging capacitor's charge levels. At the very beginning, or also known as the transient response of the current, is very rapid because the charges are anxious to get away from their mutually repelling neighbors. But as time goes by, there's less mutual repulsion and things start to diminish. So the current is decaying in a discharging capacitor exponentially as well. This is a little bit different than what we talked about with a charging capacitor. Box number three, here's the Q equals CV equation. It relates capacitor charge, capacitance, and voltage. So we need to know what capacitance means. We should first note that a capacitor's capacitance does not depend on anything other than plate geometry. Later we'll update that statement, but for now only the plate size and the plate separation determine capacitance. Capacitance is a measure of how much charge must be deposited on the plates to produce a desired voltage between the plates. Another way to think of it is capacitance determines how easily a capacitor can store charge. The Khan Academy videos I assigned really go into this very nicely and will make things super clear if they're not clear already. We have a brand new unit. If we did dimensional analysis on the Q equals CV equation and isolated for C, we would see that capacitance is given by coulombs per volt, which we will call the farad after Michael Faraday. Okay, it's time to derive the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. Go through by boxes 1 through 10 really carefully. This is a great derivation because we dust off the expression for the electric field produced by a charged plate, which we actually derived twice, once in chapter 22 and once in chapter 23. Box number 3 is reminding us that the electric field can be determined by the gradient of the voltage. Box number 9 is our capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. Once again, it's only determined by the plate area and the distance between the plates. And also so the permittivity of free space epsilon naught. You've seen epsilon naught before. I think that was introduced first in chapter 21, permittivity of free space. And in box 10, we're going to do some dimension manipulation so that we can now express permittivity of free space in terms of farads per meter. Next section, energy stored in a capacitor. This is a great visual showing what happens to store energy in a capacitor. Read through each and every one of these description bullets multiple times because one one of the two primary benefits of a capacitor is its energy storage capability. Boxes 1 through 7 derive three different formulas used to calculate the energy stored in a capacitor. Understanding in detail what's happening in boxes 1 through 7 will be very useful when it comes to solving problems and gaining really solid conceptual understanding. Next section, dielectrics. All real capacitors have dielectrics. Dielectrics alter the properties of a capacitor in profoundly important ways. Once again, the conic Academy videos I specified really do a great job describing how capacitors work in general and how dielectrics work in particular. So study boxes 1 through 4, watch the Khan Academy video about dielectrics, and know that dielectrics increase a capacitor's capacitance and its maximum operating voltage. So for example, a capacitor that might normally break down at 50 volts can operate safely at 50 volts if it has a dielectric. The other practical benefit of a dielectric is that allows the capacitor plates to be spaced really close together. Having a very small gap separation provides a lot of benefits, but it's essential that the plates of a capacitor don't make contact with each other. Lastly, there are two types of capacitors, polar and non-polar capacitors. Polar capacitors have a permanent dipole moment, which means you have to be aware of the positive terminal and the negative terminal of a capacitor. Here's a good statement you should add to your notes. Relative permittivity is the factor by which the electric field between the charges is decreased relative to a vacuum. Relative permittivity is a material constant. Check out this list of relative permittivities. You see that the relative permittivity of a vacuum is set to 1 by definition, and air is pretty close to being a vacuum as far as its permittivity is concerned. So there's Teflon, concrete, rubber, salt, silicon, water. Water is a very powerful dielectric. Next section, capacitors in series. The picture on the left shows two capacitors 
capacitors connected in series. The symbol, which we refer to as a schematic symbol, shows a capacitor as two parallel lines to represent the parallel plates. If I connect two or more capacitors in series, they blend together to provide an aggregate capacitance. The formula on the right shows this blended or equivalent capacitance. Make sure you understand this derivation and really pay close attention to the Khan Academy videos that talk about capacitors in series and capacitors in parallel. Plus there's an entire exercise on capacitors in series and in parallel. The acronym SERI-Q means capacitors in series all have the same charge. This derivation explains why, but basically if two capacitors are in series, even if they have different capacitance values, Values, they're both going to carry the same charge. For example, one capacitor might have a charge of 12 coulombs, which means the other capacitor or capacitors in series with it must always have that same charge of 12 coulombs, even if all of the capacitors are different. Last section, capacitors in parallel. The diagram on the left shows two capacitors wired together in parallel. Par V means any capacitors connected in parallel carry the same voltage. So I might have two or three or four or any number of capacitors that are connected in parallel, and even if they all have different capacitance values, they're all going to carry the same voltage if they are wired together in parallel like you see here.